Good evening, Hi. everybody. Welcome to webinar 21. Um, I only know it's 21 because last week was the big 20. Um, so tell us in the chat who you are, where in the world you are. Um, you're going to tell us what you're having for your tea. I don't need to ask you. You're going to tell us and that's OK. Yeah. Um, but because um, in the UK especially, it's a little bit miserable today. So if you can tell us something that somebody has done to make you smile and also maybe who that person is, that would be fantastic. Um, and let's have a look who is in the chat. So we have Jennifer from Nigeria who's eating pudding. Fantastic. <laughs> started because tonight we are going to be talking about if I can get it to work we're going to be talking about passing practice placements really important topic so we know that we've got lots of students here with us tonight who want to know how to pass practice placements but we know we've also got some practice educators here with us tonight and we have been joined by Joe Finch who is a friend and colleague of mine we've written things together we do a lot of work together and Joe and I are going to do the session together tonight and um, we decided partly because um, Becky sent to our WhatsApp group this the connect team WhatsApp group one morning she sent a photograph of this and it kind mm. she said this reminded me of our reflective supervision webinar because if you attended that you'll remember we did that based around the theme of Sesame Street we did have to explain this earlier to Omar because Omar wasn't a Sesame Street watcher so he didn't get the idea of the it's all uh Sesame Street is always bought to you by a letter and a number and so tonight our practice placements are bought to you by the letter P but we loved this the year 2020 has been brought to you by the letters WTF and when Omar asked for an explanation I, I thought he wanted an explanation of what WTF stood for but apparently it wasn't that it was the whole idea of Sesame Street so um but tonight there will be no use of the F word um, so, and maybe Joe will tell you a little bit later about what that means without using the F word. So tonight's all about the P word. Tonight is all about passing practice placements. So I'm going to ask you now, how many words relating to placement, beginning with the letter P, can you think of? And I'm going to ask you to put those words into the chat box. So as many words as you can think of that begin with the letter P, put those into the chat box now and the team will let us know because I can't see the chat box as you know when I'm screen sharing. So um, and then through tonight we'll see how many of those letter P's we do in our presentation. So tonight is a presentation about passing practice placements delivered in partnership between mm. Joe and I. So there's going to be lots of letter P's. But before we start the main body of the presentation, while you're all still thinking about words beginning with P that relate into practice placements, just a couple of things that I want to say to you. First of all, tonight, I'd really like it if you're chatting with one another about the points that we're making in the chat. We know now the chat has become really interactive, I think, as people are getting to know one another and we'll send out the chat tomorrow. So I would just ask you, uh, not to say where you are on placement in the chat. Just remember confidentiality. It's okay to say, oh, I've been allocated a mental health placement or something. That would be okay. But don't go beyond there. Don't say in this team, in this area because of confidentiality. Remember, that's important. Even though we're together in a safe space, we're actually still in a public space as well. We just need to remember that. Um, but a couple of words before we go on to the full presentation and I wanted to congratulate both Chris and Kat as many of you have done in the chat but of course congratulations doesn't begin with a p so I was like racking my brain what can we do so we're going to party instead because we need to do some kind of party celebration congratulations to Chris and Kat who had some great final results this week and are now uh, starting on their ASYE uh, year journey. I think, Kat, you had your first direct observation of your ASYE today, didn't you? But it I went certainly well. did, and that's probably why I look so tired. But um, yeah, it, it went really well. <laughs> it went really to get well. one out of the way. Good, good feedback. Very positive. Fabulous. 
So you see what we've got now on the team is we've got Kat and Chris in the chat can be talking to you about their placements because they've had a couple of placements, one of which was impacted by the pandemic. And then we've got others. So Omar, Diana, Kelly, who haven't yet gone on placement. And then we've got Becky, who is just about to go on her second place. No, third placement, because you have three in Wales, Becky, don't you? So her third placement. So we've got loads of placement experience in the room tonight so party was important but the other word beginning with p that i wanted to touch on before we go into our presentation is uh, i noticed this week susie dent's word of the day was pinch fart and i think that's a lovely word actually pinch fart it's a 16th century word which means miser one who withholds money to the detriment of others and uh, you know that we've done a lot in these webinars about uh, poverty uh, poverty aware practice the importance of social justice, the importance of social workers speaking out. So one P that is important, although doesn't necessarily relate into our placement presentation tonight is politics. Never forget how important politics is. And please look at what you can do to uh, redress some of the political decisions that are being made at the moment, which are completely against our social work values and ethics. So they were just a couple of P words before we begin tonight's presentation. And if you take nothing else, you can take the word pinch fart because it's a fabulous one, isn't it really? A lovely way of thinking about uh, some of the decisions that are being made. But tonight our presentation is based fully around partnership. We are going to go through a number of P's. Joe and I will do a few P's each as we go through the evening. But I think, Joe, we are starting with yours. Uh, so it's over to you. OK, so this is another uh, lovely word, uh, pernickety. Um, and it kind of means fussy or so you know take this with a bit of a pinch of salt but really it's about thinking about the very early stages of placement so you might have to fill out a placement application form or I mean universities may have different ways of doing this but you know it's it's the beginning of the matching process and I say pernickety not to be mean but you know as I said tongue-in-cheek because the reality is that the placement you ideally wanted or thought you wanted probably won't be available you know there are lots of social work students all around the country all wanting you know placements and therefore we would ask you or we would encourage you to kind of be open and flexible about what placement learning opportunity might be offered to you so um you know, be flexible about this. Yes, you might want, have wanted mental health in a particular um, area, but maybe that just isn't available. So just be open to the learning on offer. You may never work in this field again, or, but, you know, it's all about flexible, um, sorry, it's all about transferring learning. So, you, you know, in any placement, whatever kind of setting it is, statutory, voluntary, you are going to learn some really useful skills that will all be transferable to any other setting you, you go in. And what I say to students at uh, the University of East London, hello, shout out to everyone from University of East London. I saw a couple of um, messages flash by, um, but hello to everyone from all other universities. Um, really, if you think about the placement period, and I know there are different kind of days, so some might be, oh, I see, no, I went to you, yeah, and I think I remember you, Jennifer. Um, but it's not in the scheme of things, it's not a massive period of time. So it might be, I don't know, 50 days, 70 days, 80 days, 90 days. So in the scheme of things, it's a relatively short period of time. And so we would kind of encourage you to, you know, acknowledge maybe I was disappointed. I really wanted a children and families placement, but it, you know, it isn't going to happen at, at that particular point. And, you know, it is possible to transfer between adult services and children's services. So I've worked with both children and families services and adult services. And I think, you know, you can acknowledge your fears that you may have felt comfortable, I don't know, in a children and families placement because this kind of accorded with your previous experience, perhaps. But just acknowledge your fears. And we're going to come back to kind of fears a bit later on in the um, presentation. And... 
you know, it's really important that you kind of acknowledge perhaps your disappointment about what the about the placement you're offered, but really go in there with an open mind and inquiring mind. You know, and what's not really what's not helpful at all is if you sabotage the placement or the initial interview. And I'm not saying that happens a lot, but you know, it it doesn't kind of look good on any of us. Um, and I think the other thing is to remember is that everyone wants the same thing. So university staff want the same thing. Students want the same thing. Practice educators and placement. So we all want you to become the best, you know, social workers you can be. So just holding, you know, it's not a kind of us or them. We all want the same thing. And I just think whatever the learning opportunities are, make the most of them. Um, and it's funny because some of my tutees in the past who've been most upset about a particular placement absolutely loved it in the end and actually went and worked there or worked in a similar field. So just be open, be flexible, you know, acknowledge your disappointment. It wasn't quite what you wanted. Um, you know, unfortunately, I would love to give every student the placement they ideally wanted. It just there isn't enough placement supply at the moment. So there, I, my image there is, you know, being forced to eat um, uh, broccoli. And as we know, I think with fussy children, you're supposed to try something 10 times before you actually begin to like something. I'd agree with you, Joe. actually, that lots of people um, that I've worked with on placement as a practice educator will say, oh, I, I, I didn't want this placement, didn't want this placement. But if they come in with an open attitude, the learning is huge. Yeah. And very often they change their perspective by the end of the placement. So, yeah, yeah. thank you. The pernickety word there. Um, and my screen sharing doesn't seem to be going so well. So this is another one of your words, Joe. Panic. Okay, so panic. So very linked to kind of panicity. Oh my gosh, I've got this placement. Oh my goodness. And I was thinking about, you know, some of the fears around that. So, you know, can I do this? Will my practice educator like me? Will I remember what I've learned for university? Will the team like me? Will I be good enough? You know, so it's worth thinking about all those, you know, feelings you might have. But I would say, or Shaman and I would say, you know, don't panic because it would be normal that anyone starting a new job or something new will feel apprehensive. I mean, apprehension is perfectly um, normal. You know, you might be excited. I'm hoping you are excited about your placement because this is where, you know, you're going to try out maybe for the first time or the second time or the, the third one. And I think feeling apprehensive is is kind of normal and practice educators will be very aware that you'll be apprehensive. Um, but just think about all the new things you're going to learn and you will remember what you've learned at university. And if you don't, were you quite capable of going and, and finding out? Um, and I think it's worth kind of reiterating that you are all good enough to go on placement because many of you, certainly in England, I don't know about in other countries but in England um, all students are required to um, to do a preparation for practice module so we're as university staff we're all you know pretty sure that you're good enough to go out placement because if you wasn't or we had worries we wouldn't send you and so maybe you've passed a previous placement so you know just think about the panic and in um, this is a cultural reference so um, apologies to people who weren't born in England in the 1970s but this is um, a picture from a TV program in the UK called Dad's Army which was about um, kind of post-war and older men who couldn't get in the army um, kind of running the home guard and this particular um, character so Captain Wainring used to say don't panic but apologies for people who have no idea what this <laughs> reference means. I think the thing about panic though is lots of people do panic when they, they, they've got their placement or they're panicked about going out. And you're right, that, that panic is going to really negatively impact on learning and on how people present. But actually it is ordinary to feel apprehension and actually apprehension can really enhance learning, can't it? Panic prevents learning, but apprehension- I've just, I'm Sorry, I've just been corrected. It was Corporal Jones who said, don't panic, apologies. 
Okay, Corporal Jones. So apprehension can enhance learning where panic is going to negatively impact on learning. But if you follow the other P's that we're going to talk you through, then some of the panic shouldn't occur, really, or you should be able to avoid the uh, panic to some extent. So um, we did a webinar very early on, I think it was webinar two or three, where we talked about the stages of reflection. And one of the stages that we focused a lot on around reflection was the need for reflection for action, reflecting ahead of doing something. And I don't think there's any other time where it's more important to reflect for action than when you're on placement. You need to plan, you need to prepare. It's a really important stage of placement and you can't start planning and preparing too soon. I know there's people in the session tonight who have only just started first year. Placement might not happen till next year, but you can start to plan and prepare yourself for that time even now. So when you are allocated your placement and you know where you're gonna go, research the area of practice that you're going to go into. One tip I would give you is ask your practice educator what it might be helpful for you to do in preparation for starting the placement. What that demonstrates is that you're taking a proactive approach, that you're interested, that you want to take your practice educator's advice. Read your programme handbook. Every programme is different in terms of what it requires from you. So I know there are loads of books out there about placement, but actually in many ways, the most important book for you to read to prepare for placement is your programme handbook. What does that say you need to do? You've got to make sure that you know what is expected of you by your university programme on placement. And most importantly, perhaps, make sure you're aware of what documentation needs to be completed. So what placement assignments do you have to write? What's your portfolio going to look like? Make sure that you do all of that in preparation. There's a phrase, isn't there, that's used. Uh, poor preparation leads to poor performance. There's another one, isn't there? If you um, fail to prepare, you're preparing to fail. All of those things are really true. I would say a poor preparation leads to a poor placement. So planning and preparation is vital. And what I would suggest to you is that you draw up something like this, depending on your university programme. So this is a map of a placement. The kind of thing that I would do when I'm working with a student is I have something like this in each folder of the student that I'm working with, and I'll tick it off and date it when it's done. Now, because I know what's expected, I'd normally have it in more detail than this. This one is sort of concertina down, but you could plan your own. You draw up the plan of what you know is going to happen. So your placement will be allocated to you. You'll have initial contact or an informal meeting with your practice educator. Possibly if you've got an off-site practice educator, then you'll also have a practice supervisor you'll meet, team members that you'll meet. There'll be a learning agreement. Some universities will call that a contract, but you'll write something about what's expected of everybody on placement. And then when you start, there should be some form of induction. And then you've got your ongoing placement. I've just put that ongoing placement because we don't, you know, I don't know each program will be different, but it will mean that work is allocated to you. You get a variety of learning opportunities, regular supervision, lots of experiences on placement. And as part of that, you will be directly observed. Again, that differs for programmes. Most university programmes, it's a requirement for three direct observations, but that's uh, often varied uh, from university to university. You then need to put together a portfolio, um, which should start as soon as you start placement, really developing your portfolio as you go along. There'll be a midpoint review, which looks at how are things going, and then the placement will continue. Uh, if everything's good at the midpoint, then you'll just continue in the same way. If it's not, then there'll be an action plan or something that you know that needs to be done. And then portfolio completion just gives you an idea of what do you think a portfolio a placement should be like. You need to put something together around what you think is going to be your placement plan. But you need to remain flexible with the plan everybody's plan is this is how I'm going to do it but actually what happens as you go along is there's lots of ups and downs there's lots of barriers there's lots of difficulties that you face and you need to remain flexible within your placement plan so planning is really important 
Another P that I've mentioned already as part of the planning and part of the placement process is the puzzle of the portfolio. Portfolios are probably one of the most difficult things to get hold of when you do a placement. And we have reflected on and considered, maybe should we do a, um, a webinar on how do you build portfolios? And maybe we will do that at some point in the future. But the problem is, whilst every single professional portfolio has the same central theme, if you like, has the same kind of spine to it, every university program, the portfolio will have slightly different requirements. So the most important thing is know what your university expects of your placement portfolio. But this is about you building skills because you'll have a portfolio to do while you're a student. But once you qualify, it doesn't matter what country you're in, you'll be doing either a first year in practice or an ASYE year or something similar. There's a portfolio for that. If you go on to be uh, to do another qualification in social work, there'll be a portfolio in that. So developing the skills in building a portfolio are really important. A portfolio is not something you shove together at the end overnight and just pull it all together. It should grow and progress through your placement. Whatever form your portfolio takes, whatever you're expected to submit, portfolios are always triangulated, which means there should always be three sources of evidence in a practice portfolio. So there'll be observations of your practice. We've already heard Kat has done her first observation for her ASYE today. So her portfolio for the ASYE year is already underway. She got a results what, on Monday or so this week and now is already starting her ASYE portfolio. So this is something that's going to continue for you through your whole social work career. So get used to building portfolios. They will contain observations always, feedback from colleagues, from service users, from other professionals, and product evidence. Now that doesn't mean that you are going to put into a portfolio um, work documents. You shouldn't do because of data protection regulations, but there'll be some product of your thinking. So it's things like reflective accounts that you might put in there. Some universities require supervision notes to go in there. So there'll be something like that. There'll be some written record that is going into your portfolio. So there's always observation, feedback and product evidence in a portfolio. Get used to building them. They're important. Joe's going to talk to you about okay. pressure. Okay, so I just saw on the chat someone saying, I wish I hadn't come along the portfolio scaring me. So oh, don't be scared yeah. because why would anyone know what is in the portfolio? You're all learning and getting to grips with the portfolio. And it's a complex document because there's lots of different things. So if you go back to the planning and preparing, if you know what has to come when, and it would be a sequence of things to produce, then it's a kind of step-by-step -step process. So don't be frightened of it. I mean, it's not there to catch anyone out. It's there to, you know, the, the assessment tasks are there to, you know, assess you. But, you know, what I'm thinking of, it's now it kind of, it feels pressured, doesn't it? It feels pressured because you are being assessed by your field educator, practice educator. I, I know field educators used in other countries. So you may feel this pressure and of course, you know, for social work students across the world, they are often studying, maybe one, two days a week, and they are out on placement. So that's a lot for anybody. But I think it's worth thinking about, you know, um, that these pressures are going to be there anyway. And I started doing this PowerPoint of all the kind of pressures that you might have on placement. So you've got your university work to worry about or to do or to building. Um, you might have your personal things to worry about. You might have to do some reading. You've got writing up to do. You've got the actual casework to do. So you may feel kind of under considerable um, pressure and I guess it's worth thinking about what works for you in terms of planning and managing all these different um, pressures. And I think the first thing is to just be kind to yourself and, you know, that you can plan. But as Siobhan alluded to earlier, there will be things that, you know, 
that you're you're not anticipating. Um, so I know Natalie's just said I'm feeling the pressure already. Yeah, there there is an awful lot, and I think everybody recognises that you are under an awful lot of pressure plus all your outside things. <laughs> So whatever way of managing all your demands, I mean, I don't use post-it notes, but I use um, to-do lists. And also just being kind to myself and realizing I can't do everything. When I'm really busy, you know, if I don't hoover, the world isn't gonna come to an end. So do ask other people for help because other people around you will be very aware that the kind of pressure that you're, you're under. And I guess thinking about where does that pressure come from? So are you yourself creating um, the pressure because you want to, you know, achieve top marks in everything? Um, you know, in, in some ways you need to be under pressure because that's the reality of the social work task. Um, and just think about the other pr pressures that you personally might face. I think it's really interesting, Jay, what you say. Think about where the pressure comes from. I think it was Jade last week in our webinar last week who said, don't compare yourself to other people in the chat. And Jade is, is first year at the moment. So, but I think that's a, a message that you can take into placement. Because I, I remember, you know, I, I've worked with students as a practice educator for 27 years and students have said so many things to me over the years. But I remember the kinds of things students will say to me, things like, well, my friend, I remember one person said something along the lines of, well, my friend yesterday, she did three assessments. She she sectioned somebody and she did such and such. And it was like, and I was, well, no, actually, we wouldn't talk about sectioning somebody. We would talk yeah. about a compulsory admission. And actually, as a student, she's not going to have done that. And she's not going to have, but people kind of tell one another, I've done this, I've done that. And, and they get so wound up sometimes, a student, about what other students are doing. That doesn't matter. Don't compare your journey to anybody else's. And that was said very strongly in our webinar last week and applies to placements as well, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, so this is okay. your placement. This is your learning opportunity. And everyone has a different starting place and practice educators will respond to that. So, yes, it may be that your friend has five cases and you've only got three, but we don't know what those five cases are. You know, they could be very you know, I don't mean simple, but they could have one or two tasks to do on them. So don't kind of um, compare. That's what said about group chats. Now, WhatsApp chats amongst students is really useful, I think, but sometimes they can become a bit competitive. And I think that's where the pressure can build up. I mean, mm. just think of it as your personal learning journey. Other people have their own learning journeys. Absolutely. And that pressure that people are feeling about the portfolio, I don't want to say about the portfolio to scare you. What I'm trying to say is I think sometimes people don't read so much about the portfolio because they think, oh, that's something. The deadline for handing in the portfolio is six months away. So I'll think about it then. But actually, what I'm saying is those of you who are going to be starting placement soon, look at what the portfolio requirements are so that from the outset, you know what you're expected to submit at the end of the placement yeah so and what, pressure, preparing and what i've given the uh they won't mind me saying the ma social work students at uel just for their dissertation but i think it's important is a kind of a planning document so it's just on a word document i've got the weeks and then it's i've just got them to think about when can they realistically work on the dissertation but when are there things related to the placement so at UEL we know that February will be the time of midway um, meetings and reports so just to plan the whole year and you know I mean it's I mean I do do this because it just makes my life easier really but I know come February I won't be able to work on the dissertation you know so when can I work on it and so it's just planning the whole year on a I mean, it's a simple word document I um I don't know why but I just print it off on larger a3 paper so I can physically write on it um I mean you can do these online but it you know it's just planning the whole year ahead and yes you are going to be under pressure at certain moments but it's worth thinking that there may be key moments of pressure but that won't be like that for the whole six months or or nine months 
Absolutely. And I think that idea of planning the year, getting ahead of things is really helpful because it's what we need. It's a skill we need to learn as social workers, isn't it? So another P, a P I'm going to take us into is purpose. Always understanding why you are doing what you're doing is really important. Knowing what is the purpose of this. Everything in social work has a purpose. You know, relationships that you develop they have a purpose you're not developing a relationship simply to develop a relationship what's the purpose of that relationship why do we need that relationship everything that we do in social work has a purpose and it's important for you to think about and understand the why of practice and I talk about this all the time so I don't want to spend ages on it if you've not heard me talk about this I would suggest maybe re-watching the short video on YouTube where I go through the what, why and how framework as part of your preparation for placement, because this can be a really good framework for everything in social work, but particularly for preparing for placement. So think about you're going to be asked, as Joe said, everybody has a different starting point for placement. So one of the first things you're going to be asked is what are your learning needs? And that really throws a lot of people straight away because you almost don't know what you don't know. So it can be quite difficult to identify what are my learning needs. So if you work through what do I need to learn? Why is that important? How will that impact on my practice? This can be a really good way of considering your learning needs. So what, why, how is really important? What, why and how is important in anything that we do in social work? what, why, how, and next week's webinar is all going to be about the what, the why, and the how of supervision. So what, why, how is really important. The danger is in contemporary practice, one of the things that's lost is the why. A lot of social workers now are much more, what's happening? How do I deal with it? What's going on? How do I respond? And we can lose the why in practice when we've been practicing a long time. One of the reasons I love working with students and most practice educators that I talk to say they love working with students is because students ask us why. Why do you do it like that, Siobhan? And it helps us to refresh our own practice. It helps us to think about, well, actually, I've just done it like that for 10 years. I've not thought about it for a while. So you asking a why question is really helpful. But I've noticed that maybe I can't be exact when this has started happening, but maybe the last five or six years, I've noticed students are less often asking me why questions. And I find students are asking me questions like, what form do I fill in? How do I do this? What should I do next? Never feel frightened to ask the why question. The why question is the most powerful question you can ever ask. And, a, and your practice educator will want you to ask why not in a negative way, but in a positive way. Why do we do it like that? Why is it like this? Why do you think this is happening? Ask why regularly, because it demonstrates professional curiosity, it demonstrates interest, and it helps you to keep why at the center of your practice. And that's a really acknowledged, having the, the importance of why is acknowledged in leadership theory, um, Simon Sinek does a lot of work on what he calls the golden circle, which is that why sits in the center of everything that we do. So why influences what we do and how we do it. So understanding your why is important. Knowing why you want to be a social worker is really important. Your practice educator is likely to say to you, why are you interested in social work? Why do you want to be a social worker? And you need something in depth to be able to explain that. So just keep focused on the purpose in everything that you do because good social work has why at the start of practice but also at the very heart of practice so understanding the purpose is important I remember doing a um, going out and doing a direct observation with a student last year and we were in the it was before covid so we were driving there together in the car and i uh, said so what's this what what is it we're doing today why are you doing this visit and they said oh it's a stat visit that's not why we're doing the visit that's what it is i want to know why i want to understand your purpose in going somewhere so why is central 
you always need to be able to answer the why question. So purpose is an important P. And then I'm going to go back to Joe with the next couple of P's. OK, so we've got people. So you might think, well, that's a very obvious P, uh, Joe and Siobhan. But actually, you know, people are the people we work with are the people we serve. So it's worth thinking about that. But I'm interested who, which other people may, mm, mate, sorry, I can't speak properly, might you come across on a placement? So do you want to put that in the chat? So who might you come across? Um, so patients, peers, they don't have to start with P, but, you know, doctors, <laughs> nurses, I like that. Colleagues, yep, so other social workers, police, other professionals families okay look at them okay so the thing about wow so my suggestion I'm just looking at the chat sorry I got distracted um you know if you are you know if it's appropriate you can always ask other people you know why do they do what they do why are they making the decisions they are doing um because it's quite interesting you know, thinking about how other professionals work, what's their focus, um, what are their values, you know, why are police officers working in a particular way? So don't be shy, ask why. Um, and I guess similarly, you know, just, you know, we are serving people, they're not serving us, we are serving other people. And I think we, you know, have to keep the people we work with um, at the heart of everything we do you know and it's a bit of a cliche but would we want you know how we interact and engage with people would we want to be you know how would we how do we like to be interact interacted with and engaged with and I suppose people and purpose connect together yeah. as well yeah. Joe. because basically people is the very purpose of social work isn't it we wouldn't exist if it wasn't well, for people yeah. And, you know, do, don't be shy. Do talk to other professionals <laughs> yeah. um, because it's it's interesting sometimes about the kind of the stereotypes about other um, professionals. Mm. But also, you know, you can perhaps challenge stereotypes of social work. So I can remember saying to an educational psychologist, I'm on a master's in social work. And she said, oh, I didn't know you had to be that qualified to be a social worker. So it was yeah, it kind of annoyed me, but actually it got me to reflect on how other professionals might view social workers. So I gave her a bit of a lesson in uh, social work education. Now, I'm not suggesting other professionals will be mean, but it's just worth, you know, if you can, asking them why. Mm, absolutely. And then we have your next P, which is a fascinating uh, slide. A practice educator. Now... As you can see, I've got Darth Vader there. So apologies if you're not a Star Wars fan. But I think it's worth thinking about the practice educator. I know we've got practice educators in the audience, so um, I'm not suggesting you're like an evil Darth Vader. But I think sometimes we can build up an image of a practice educator or what a practice educator is or isn't that maybe um, is inaccurate. Um, so... Um, really, a practice educator is it's a it's an interesting role. So I'm talking about field educators in other contexts. So it's an interesting role and it's a complicated role. And listed to the side of this PowerPoint is all the kind of tasks a practice educator might perform. So a manager, enabler of learning and all the things you see there. So facilitator, supervisor, assessor, teacher, supporter, negotiator, planner, mediator, mentor. And most importantly, is gatekeeper to the profession. And I guess these kind of roles could perhaps make students feel uh, pressured, perhaps, or, uh, uh, you know, and for a student, it's also a peculiar role. What is it to be a social work student? So you're not quite a member of staff, but you are, um, you know, you're not there as a member of staff. And sometimes you'll need to be assertive about that. Um, but think of all these different roles. Now, some of those may conflict or, you know, be difficult um, to manage. So in my research, I found that some practice teachers 
like the enabler of learning, the facilitator, but found the kind of the assessor part, the gatekeeper to the profession part, kind of difficult. But what I would suggest is that these are these kind of care versus control, if you like, um, uh, dualities are really the essence of social work, aren't they? And I think, you know, these debates are really interesting. And you can think about in your own, own roles as social work students, do you, you know, do you facilitate people you work with? You know, are you supporting them or you, you, you're assessing them? Um, so it's just worth bearing that in mind. And what I would say is practice educators on the on the whole do not have to take students. They're not obliged to take students. Certainly in UK, they're not, they don't have to, it's a choice. Um, in other professions, it's not a choice. So for nurses, when if they want to go up the scale, they have to work as a nurse mentor. So there's a, a financial inducement. Um, so I want you to kind of remember that, that as you're going out on placement or meeting your practice educator, they are taking you on by choice, largely. No one's forced to do it because it, it just, you know, practice educators are busy. And yes, they are busy, but they're still wanting to have students. And I think it's, you know, actually being a practice educator when I was working in, you know, dealing with very difficult child protection concerns, actually being a practice educator was an absolutely, the bit of my job I really liked because it reminded me why I'd gone into the profession in the first place. You know, I like the why questions. You know, I could, you know, think more creatively about the work I was doing with the, the, the students input. Um, mm. You know, so just think about these roles. It's complex, it's difficult, it's a strange role, but then so is the role of a student social worker. And I just, I looked up yesterday a Darth Vader quote, but I kind of like this because what I see at my university is many former students coming back to be practice educators. So I really like that, the kind of the circle, the giving back. Um, mm. I, I think it's um, a P for me listening as a practice educator is, I find being a practice educator a real privilege actually and working with students. And um, so I think it's a really good message, Joe, that you give that actually, you know, practice educators want to be supportive, want to be there for students. So, um, yeah. and it is important. So we're gonna just, uh, I'm just gonna remind you, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this at all because Joe's research study, uh, she's turned it around for us today and is going to share that with us in a moment. And that's the key part of today, really. But one another P that we think is important is to remind you to pause, to reflect, to take some time to reflect. For me, I think reflection is perhaps the most important aspect of placement learning. So you're going to need to take your reflections to supervision. You need to share your reflections with your practice educator. What I'd suggest is you need to find a model that works for you. And what we've been doing through all of these webinars is showing you that there are lots of different models of reflection. Personally, as a practice educator, I'm just going to suggest two models to you that I think might be useful for you as students on placement. The first one is this, taken from the University of York, originally from their collaborative model of direct observation. So it comes from a placement perspective. Um, but what I would ask you to do is each week, maybe at the end of each week, however you want to do it, just think through these four words. There's no question. It's just like a word association game. At the end of your first week on placement, just take a moment to think about surprises. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think surprises? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think satisfactions or dissatisfactions or learning? And if you do this, the key thing about this is it really helps you to pinpoint your progress. So there's another double P there, but it helps you because what surprises you in the first week, a few weeks later, you've forgotten, you know, that, well, you're not surprised by it anymore. And a few weeks after that, you've forgotten you were even surprised by it in the first place. So this helps you to demonstrate your growth and your progress. So somewhere keep a bit of a reflective journal. Um, and use this as a tool to reflect on each week. 
And then the other model that I would recommend to you, and I know I recommend it quite a lot, so you may be fed up by it, but is the weather model of reflection. It's a great model of reflection to reflect on a period of time. Now, this model is particularly good to think about your whole placement. So when you're either, when you're coming towards your midpoint review, you can think about the first period of placement or when you're coming towards the end, or you can do it at both. In preparation for your midpoint and in preparation for the end of your placement, think about what's been the sunshine moment of my placement so far. What's been the rainiest moment? What does that mean? What was the, um, the, the snow? What does that mean? The snow moments, ice, um, lightning, thunder. Think about every form of weather and what that means to you in terms of your placement. And it throws up some really helpful reflections. It's a really good one that for reflecting on a period of time. So those two models particularly will help you to pause and reflect along the way. Yeah. Joe's going to talk to you about other P's now though. So we thought um, perspectives was a useful P and I think you know the, it kind of <laughs> links to the first reflective model about surprises and some of those surprises may be seeing different or hearing different perspectives so those perspectives might come from you know people in the team, other social work students, other professionals um, and it's just worth you know, reflecting on people's perspectives and thinking, why might they have that particular perspective? So might, might it be a kind of a professional value-based perspective? Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? How, you know, an, an event can happen and we all see different things in it. You know what I mean? I, I can remember at school where they used to get us, they used to, a teacher used to come in and say something, go out, and then we all had to write about what the teacher had said and when they came in, it was about evidence and um, you know, that actually um, observation skills. And But I really like this image and I think it's just worth reflecting on different perspectives. And I think if you can really get a tool, a reflection tool that works for you and has meaning for you, um, because I know some students have never had to reflect before. Why would, why would you, you know? You know, and the thing about social work is that we, we say, well, here's this knowledge habit, but actually in practice, it might not work as smoothly or as clearly as that. So do think about perspectives, you know, different perspectives about a situation. You know, and I think often in social work, there isn't one perspective, there are multiple um, perspectives. So, <laughs> so now I'm afraid we are at the P, the problem, <laughs> the problem, um, play, uh, the problems. And I don't want to frighten students. I don't want you all to run away or practice educators, you know, to run away at this point. And I use the term struggling because I think it, it, it demonstrates that all students will struggle at some points with some aspects of the placement. And I want to reassure you all that actually the number of students that fail a placement, certainly in England, and I know this is true, Australia and uh, America, because I've looked at the research, you know, very few students fail a social work programme. So it's something like two to three percent in England. And that that has been constant, um, even with the changes of um, types of qualification. So I think it's worth thinking about this, you know, that I'm not, <laughs> that if you're demonstrating some of these behaviours, then it may be that your practice educator may start to worry about you or, so it's about, you know, so thinking about resp responding appropriately to constructive feedback. And obviously we ask practice educators that feedback is constructive not destructive and Siobhan's going to talk about that in a later slide but you know when we start to get um slightly con or when concerns start arising about students on placement what we've seen in research are certain characteristics you know and I don't want to pathologize everyone in this way but sometimes you know there's often lateness to placement and it may seem a very small thing, but actually constant lateness, um, you know, doesn't show your professionalism, another P. 
And also I know from the service user groups and the experts by experience groups that we work for that social workers being late is really difficult because they get anxious while they're waiting for social workers visits. And I know how, how I feel when I go for a medical appointment and I've sat there for an hour getting more and more anxious. I mean, sometimes we worry about when work that's given to students just doesn't seem to be taken off in the way we might um, expect. They may struggle to reflect. So, you know, the message of finding the model that works for you. So some people might like to write a journey, um, a journal, sorry. Um, you know, and practice educators will help you because no one's born with the gift of applying theory to practice. I and mean, when we can say it, you know, you've got apply theory to practice. But just, you know, it's really thinking about the why, you know, and, and thinking about knowledge. So there may be theory about why people behave the way they do. There may be theory or knowledge about um, how one might intervene. And there might be theory or knowledge about organisational um, kind of processes and systems. And really use supervision to the best effect. So what I mean by that is just remember it's your supervision session. It's your learning. It's not your practice educator's um, supervision session. And I have observed supervision sessions when I was mentoring uh, new practice educators. Um, but when I heard practice educators talk more than the student, then to me that's kind of a bit worrying so at the start of the placement perhaps your practice educator will be taking the lead but I guess as the placement progresses you should be talking more and use it it's your supervision you're not going to get an hour and a half supervision when you're qualified so make the use of it and I guess we get concerned when uh, students may blame others or perhaps appear overly or underconfident and of course it, it would be it's you know practice educators, we understand that, you know, if you've never worked in a statutory service or if you've never worked with this particular service user group, you may well feel underconfident, but it's developing strategies to kind of manage that. It may be struggling with the emotional demands of the work. And in my work with practice educators, there's different views about this. So we're back to different perspectives. So, um, you know, I, I mean, my perspective if, if students are confronted with very difficult things on placements for the first time and they get upset to me that's kind of understandable but it's about how you get upset and where but also you know another thing would be relationship with team members so use the team members I mean they should kind of help you and I know we weren't going to say the f word but I guess that's the worry is it that's the pressure that's the fear am I good you know am I good enough to pass this placement and I guess really these are very kind of entrenched issues where, you know, practice um, is potentially dangerous or risky or a student might do something that for any member of staff um, may result in a, a suspension. You know, so really this inability to reflect on your own practice. I mean, so yes, I know students find it hard and, you know, you're on a journey, you're learning all the time how to do this. But I guess if people just cannot see their part in a situation, I guess serious concerns with communication or others or relationships broken down. I mean, the rare occasions we do have formal complaints. Um, and I guess really, you know, you have an assessment criteria in place, you know, there's different ones in England to Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, in other countries, in other, you know, some are national systems, some are local systems, but there is an assessment criteria, there are a set of tasks or competencies or capabilities that do need to be um, met. And um, um, if we move on to the next slide, because I just want to kind of carry on with that theme. All right. So, yes, I focus on student characteristics and traits. And, you know, we, we, we do see some of that. And sometimes when we're anxious or under pressure, we perhaps don't show our best selves. So again, you know, reflecting on how I might come across. So sometimes people are anxious and come across as kind of, you know, um, slightly aggressive when they didn't mean to be 
But it's worth noting that actually practice educators or and a placement can equally let students down. So in my work as a university tutor, when I've gone out to see students on placement in the days where I could um, go out to see students on placement, of course. But, you know, practice educators, you know, sometimes can perhaps have unrealistic expectations of what students um, can do or should know. Um, and. I guess there's a process with the university where we would try and help kind of negotiate what's a reasonable expectation. I guess not planning the placement, and I understand that sometimes placements do happen very last minute, but really, you know, planning the placement properly. So the student feels welcome. So, you know, turning up and no one's thought about a desk. And again, I'm talking about days when you could go into an office you know, or focusing on casework supervision and the theory, the reflection gets lost, so not doing the supervision um, and being anti-theory or anti-university. So, I, you know, there it can be a bit of a divide, can't there, between the university where you just teach us all theory and then the placement is where we do it properly. And I think just beware about those kind of divisions between universities and placements because as I said at the very start we all want the same thing practice educators want the same thing students want the same thing we want the same things we want to give you a, a challenging but supportive learning experience so that you can be the best social worker you can be um, but actually you know getting to grips with theory with knowledge is an important part of the task for students internationally and really not giving the student enough time so the placement itself can let the student down by not having appropriate learning opportunities. So either they're too kind of complicated or they're just not robust enough. Using the student as a scapegoat for team tension. So what I mean by that is sometimes there are tensions in a team and a kind of an outsider goes in and all these tensions are kind of centered around um, the student and that is just totally inappropriate. So uh, I can remember when I worked in a charity and we had a number of students in uh, the organisation and there was somebody who was particularly unhappy. She used to kind of criticise staff members through the students, you know, and we had to say that's just not a good learning experience for the student. And of course, it's not that we want to protect you or cover you in cotton wool because, you know, these are organisational team issues that are found everywhere. And I think, um, you know, what can also let students down is other team members not playing a part or role. And, you know, I just think a, a really wonderful learning experience would be going out on visits with lots of different team members. How do they do it? How do they see it? What are their perspectives? You know, what a wonderful learning experience. And of course, you know, the manager using a student as a team member because they might have so many cases they need to get off the system. But this is where your, your negotiator part of your practice educator comes in and just says, you know, actually, these aren't appropriate for the student. There's too many. It's not meeting the student's learning need. And what really, really annoys me more than anything is when people in teams refer to the student rather than by your name. So if you're ever called the student, then I would challenge that in, a, in an appropriate way, because it's quite demeaning, isn't it, to be called the student. And in terms of what to do, you know, there will be bumps and things in all placements. But what I would urge everyone to do is just talk about the issues as soon as they arise, because often they're small things. But if they get left, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then perhaps when they're addressed, a student might say, but you didn't tell me about this six weeks ago. Um, so just address them as soon as they arise. And I put here issues or concerns. I mean, you choose the appropriate word. And I think it's just working to address that concern, you know, constructively and openly. And to be honest and courageous. So um, perhaps in another session where we'll talk about courageous conversations, but, you know, having perhaps difficult conversations and what can escalate a situation from minor to major is kind of involving the university tutor about anyone's knowledge that kind of ups the stakes but do follow the university's processes so in the university's handbooks will be the procedure so what to do um, 
if there are issues. And of course, you know, you might not in a million years choose your practice educator to be your friend. You may have different ways of going about it, but you know, you're in a professional relationship and the expectation is that you will work to address kind of issues. And I think just saying it's a personality um, clash is really not sufficient. Mm, I agree. Thanks, Joe. One thing that I think can happen and can have an impact on the problem issues is power. And I think particularly the sense, the student's sense of the power held by the practice educator. And I think sometimes maybe it is that, I don't know, scary Darth Vader figure that people think of, don't they? And think of all, all the power is in the practice educator's hands. And um, I'm just going to, I'm not going to talk about this very much other than to say that we looked at this. If you remember, those of you who've been to everything, the webinars that we're doing, we're trying to give you the skills and the knowledge that you need going into placement. So go back and revisit maybe the power webinar where we looked at reflecting on the flow of power and maybe thinking about the fact that students can feel that practice educators have all of the professional power, all of the resource power and all of the power to determine. So it can feel very much like the power is flowing away from you and that you can feel powerless in a practice placement situation. But it's really important to recognize that actually that reflects social work in many ways. So if we change the title of who's up here, if this, we have service user and the social worker or the student social worker, the power flow is all with you as the student when you're with a service user. So it's important to recognize that whilst you might feel powerless within the organization, you are to the service user very powerful. And I would encourage you, especially because as you know, moving into critical reflection means bringing in issues of power and the socio-political context. So I would encourage you to look at the construction of power, how power is made up, the way in which it's very complex, it's multi-layered. You may feel that you lack power as a student in a situation, but actually in some aspects of your work, you hold lots of power. And how do we hold power? Where do we hold power? Just, I would encourage you as part of your preparation for placement to go back and re-watch that webinar on power and empowerment and think about your use of power as a student social worker so it's another p that we think is very important I'm going to have to go go through this one fairly quickly i think joe because of time but this is yeah for you. okay so it you know to just be proactive so the message i'm trying to give you that this is your placement you know yes you might not have chosen that placement and the work you know will be decided but you know this is your placement so make the most of it and if you're interested in particular issues or topics or or things you're really interested in then ask put that in your learning agreement um your initial learning agreement so i i kind of <laughs> i called it the abc of being proactive and i just kind of you you know um pick some words which i thought was you know kind of positive and how you might want to be as a proactive student social worker out on placement um you know you're there to kind of learn you know to observe what's going on and just think about your abc so maybe you can reflect after this webinar what's your abc about being proactive I love some of the quotes you put there. I love that. Don't wait for your ship to come in, swim out to it. And, and for me, that's really yeah. important. I really want to see a student come in very proactive, keen, demonstrating, I really want to do yeah. this. Um, you know, if I ask a student if they want to prepare something for supervision and then that doesn't happen, it does make me think, well, how, how proactive are you being within this? And whilst I recognise there are lots of uh, pressures, wanting students to demonstrate um i love what you say at the bottom there joe it is your placement you shape it you're the one that shapes it yeah i mean some placements you can shape more than others mm. but mm. you know and and i train practice educators and new practice educators and i say to them it's not your placement <laughs> it's the student's placement so you know i've got this image of um 
like a coach and horses and I did actually try to get one on the PowerPoint but I couldn't find the one I like but you know your it's your placement you're you're driving the coach here and really in some ways maybe your practice educator really should be the passenger in the back <laughs> you know mm. I'm not saying you're in charge exactly but you know you can shape it you know mm. and what you uh, it's, it's a cliche but you know what you put in you'll get out and for me as a practice educator you know for students you know even if they're assertive and say, look, I really want to do this. I really want to do that. I really want to do that. And I'd really like the experience of that. You know, that's fantastic because I can organise that. Yeah, absolutely. So we would also encourage you to take a positive approach to feedback. So we want you to take a proactive approach, but we also want you to take a positive approach to feedback. Uh, I think this relates back to what does it mean to be overconfident that you said earlier, Joe, and a couple of people in the chat were saying, what does that mean? Well, for me, being overconfident is if you're not taking um, the feedback, you're not taking feedback that's being given to you. So it's important that you maintain an open attitude to feedback. Don't be defensive. Employ your active listening skills. Keep focused on the feedback. And if you need to clarify it. So as you're listening, if you don't understand it, say, could you explain that for me? Could you help me to understand that? If, if somebody says that to me when I'm giving feedback, it shows, OK, you're trying to listen. You're trying to learn from this. If you need to write the feedback down to help you to understand it. A key thing is don't take criticism personally. Feedback needs to be given in a way which is constructive, but it can still give you a negative. It can still be this needs to improve. That's it. That's constructive. It's the way it's provided. Mm -hmm. But don't take criticism personally. Reflect on the feedback that you're given. Recognize your learning. And one thing I would say to everybody is note your own emotional reactions. When somebody's giving you feedback, if you become angry or defensive, note that in yourself, because if that's your response, it's likely that the feedback's accurate, actually, um, because it's a kind of fight or flight response to it. So think about how you respond to feedback. What I would say to you is that it's very important to value the feedback that you're given. It's the key way to learn is how to get feedback is learning. Um, so when somebody gives you feedback, value it. Somebody gives you feedback, the first thing to do is say, thank you for the feedback. I can tell you as a practice educator, you know, it's, it, I take a lot of time to think about how do I give this person feedback? How do I word the feedback? And it's quite challenging sometimes, especially if you know, I really need to give this person feedback. I know they're probably not going to be keen on, but I really need to let them know this. So be open towards feedback. Now, we're not going to be able to go through all of this, but I will make sure that if we can't get all of the slides out to you, that this grid comes out to you, because this is one I spent quite a lot of time working on. What does it mean to be negative or to take a closed approach to feedback? What does it mean to be positive or take an open approach to feedback? What demonstrates the two approaches. So we would really ask you to take a positive approach to feedback. It's really important, that whole positivity yeah. about feedback. And but then, do, do, but people, sorry, do hear the positive feedback as well, because what people hear is the negative feedback and they don't hear the positive feedback. Yes, I think you're right. People only hear the negative. They don't listen to, they, they switch off when the good stuff's coming. You're right, positive yeah, feedback, yeah. listen to it. And then the final P is going to take us, in a way, almost back to the start. We've been talking about placements and the P of placements is place. And that's really important. Ment, M-E-N-T, is a suffix. It's something that can be put on the end of a word to mean something. And actually, meant as a suffix apparently means action or process. So if we put meant on the end, it means action or process. So actually the word placement means action in place. It's all about doing something in the place that it takes place. So key thing, understand the area that your placement works in. So if you don't know the town or you don't know that particular bit of the town, 
do a bit of research into it. The census information is going to be very old now because we've got a new census next year, haven't we? But just do a bit of digging around. What do people know about that local area? You know, find out some local facts about the kind of makeup of the population. That sort of thing is really important to understand the place that you're going to be working in. But equally, Joe's said a few times about things like desks of things like that's a lot of that is pre-COVID. You know, you are likely during the pandemic to be doing at least some of your placement based at home. So the place of placement might be your kitchen table or it might be, a, you know, uh, at the corner of your bedroom or something. So work out where are you going to work when you're at home? because you are going to need to think about confidentiality in the space that you're working in. You know, you can't go and work in a hall's kitchen and do your, your um, placement practice there. You're going to need to think about confidentiality. So think about all of those aspects of place. So to give a quick summary, but we're not going to call it a summary. We're going to call it a pricey, which is just a posh name for a summary, but it begins with P. To give us a quick summary of the P's, then the 15 P's that we've gone through with you, although we've thrown a few extras in as well, are pernickety. Joe talked to you about pernickettiness and panic. And I talked to you about the need to plan and prepare and be aware of the portfolio puzzle. Um, Joe talked to you about pressure. I talked about purpose. Joe talked about people and practice educators. And I talked to you about pausing to reflect. Joe talked about perspectives and problems on placement. I talked to you about power. Joe talked about taking a proactive approach to your placement, shaping it for yourself. And I've talked about taking a positive approach, both to placement and to feedback. And we've talked about the place of placement. If you think about all of those 15, then what you will have is rather than the F word, which we're not going to mention, uh, we're going to talk about the P word, pass. If you take all of those P's into account, you will have a pass of your placement, passing your practice placement as we talked about. But there's always something to be added to the pricey. There is a PS, a postscript. So on top of our 15 P's, Joe is going to give you our postscript. Okay. So really... <laughs> You know, this is the kind of key messages, really. But, you know, essentially, we've got the pass at the middle. That's what everyone wants. That's what your practice educator wants. That's what we want as university staff. Of course, that's what you want. But really, you know, enjoy it. It's not for the rest of your life. You're never going to have an experience like that again, where you have, you know, limited numbers of uh, work to do and a practice educator. Learn, learn all you can. And then thrive. So hopefully all these P's will help you th thrive, not just survive. So I don't like, there's a book about <laughs> surviving your placement or surviving social work. We shouldn't be surviving, we should be thriving. And what the next one really is about experience. So just open yourself up to all these experiences. And the fact is in social work, there's always surprises. You will, you know, there's never a time where you will know everything. There's always new things to know. And really just reflect, use that time to reflect. You know, now our placements at UEL, we build in reflection time within the placement day. So wherever you can find time to reflect. So I used to reflect on public transport. That's what I'm missing now being at home so much is my space for reflection. Public transport isn't there anymore. And as I said, be enthusiastic because it would be worrying if you're not enthusiastic. Yes, you might be anxious and upset and slightly, you know, nervous about the placement, but be enthusiastic. You know, you've applied to come on a social work course. You're interested in social work. And this is where it all comes together and really starts to make sense. So ask questions. I mean, I say this to students, ask questions. How will I know as a university tutor or a practice educator, how will I know about your learning if you don't ask me questions. I think I'm giving the right information, but obviously the questions help me. So it's not only about helping you, it helps me understand what I need to do differently or better and really enjoy it. Um, and as I said, it's your placement, shape it, but enjoy it. 
absolutely. And I think people will enjoy it if they go with those 15 P's that we talked about heading towards a pass. Um, I've been qualified 30 years. If, if anybody asked me, can you remember a lecture? Can you tell me about this lecture? Can There's very little I remember about the lectures. And actually so much of that learning has changed since because legislation's changed, theory's changed. But I remember every one of my four placements. We did four placements back when I trained and I remember every one of them. I remember key learning points. I remember my practice educators. Placement is a key part of social work training and a really important part. So we do have a picture that somebody shared on social media earlier that we want to share. Chris is going to share her screen in a moment. But just to remind you all, we like to tell you at the end what we've got coming up. Next week, we're going to be looking at making the most of supervision, the what, the why and the how. And that will feed into and follow on from today because supervision is a key part of placement. But it's also for all social workers. How do we make the most of the supervision that we get? Then we're going to be looking at relationship based practice. Then we've got digital safeguarding, which I, uh, is going to be fabulous. I've seen uh, a little bit of an insight into that's going to be great. And then we're going to be looking at age assessments. So over the next month, we've got some really interesting topics there. But at this point, so I think the team are going to put the link in for you to register for next week now. Um, but at this point, I'm going to stop screen sharing. We're hoping that uh, Chris is going to get the opportunity to screen share, to share with you something that was shared with us on social media earlier. Uh, so thank you for that. We loved that. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember who it was that posted it. If I'll have a quick look on Twitter, but a uh, fabulous tweet from somebody uh, on Twitter earlier. I think that's for tea or educational uh, food going on there. Maybe that's the uh, answer to what did you have for your tea, Kelly? I had sweets that spelt out practice placement. Marvellous. Thank you so much for sharing that. We really liked that. To see that I've just noticed a spelling mistake. <laughs> oh, it needs a, yeah, it needs an E before the M. Maybe they didn't have little Bs, did they? So um, it was, it was what we call adapting and creativity, maybe, Joe. That's the thing. Yeah, about. yeah. But we all knew what it meant. See, different perspectives. Absolutely. Understood different what it meant. Absolutely. So thank you so much to Joe for sharing with us tonight. Joe normally talks about the F word and tonight we've been talking all about the P words. So it was marvellous. Thank yeah. you so much, everybody, for joining in tonight. And thank you to the team for nearly making me cry just before we started, which wasn't always the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you ever so much. And we'll hopefully see you all next week. So night, everybody. Bye.